Hey folks, Jeremiah here from trappingtoday.com and in this video I want to give you an update on fur prices for the 2018-2019 fur selling season. So we're going to focus on wild fur prices that we trappers harvest over the course of the fall and winter and basically I'm going to be very honest with you. Um, basically you could read my 2017-2018 fur market forecast 2016 2017 fur market forecast and prices 2015 2016 the fur market has not changed a great deal in the last two or three years it's actually from all accounts of the more experienced uh, fur buyers and people that have been in the market forever they say that they haven't seen fur this low for this long so it's kind of a tough really tough market for wild fur and it just doesn't seem to be bouncing back. In the past, it's gone down and it's come back up. There are a number of underlying reasons for that. So what we're gonna do is a couple of things. First, um, I am going to go over the underlying mechanisms, just a, a broad overview of why fur prices are where they are and the factors that influence that. And uh, we'll do that just generally. And then we'll go into what to expect in the coming market for specific species and numbers uh, that I think we're gonna get for those individual species. So again, these are predictions. Uh, anybody could be wrong, uh, but I've, it's been pretty darn close. The last few years I've done these forecasts has been pretty close. I hope, uh, I hope I'm wrong, I hope I'm low, and then prices uh, get higher, uh, but uh, that remains to be seen. So anyway, for a couple of other things, if you are looking for more details on this, you can go to trappingtoday.com, look for the fur price updates, fur market forecast, um, and other articles there. You can also just do a Google search on fur prices. You're gonna, I'll be, uh, Trapping Today shows up, uh, blows up the front page of Google for fur prices. So you should be able to find that really easily. But uh, let's go over just a, a quick overview of the, the market. Basically, the majority of wild fur that's harvested in North America is sold in, in um, two countries in the across the pond. Uh, Russia and China are the primary uh, buyers of our wild fur. You also have buyers in Italy and Greece and uh, South Korea. So there, there are a number of, of different markets and different niche markets, but the vast majority, the bulk of the fur is purchased by Russia and China, and uh, probably the vast majority of it is actually worn by people in Russia. Russians wear a lot of fur. It's uh, a big fashion statement, but uh, it's also a huge utility. Russians, it, it's incredibly cold. Uh, I think Maine is cold where I live. Uh, it's nothing compared to Siberia. Um, it, you know, we're talking some pretty brutal weather in areas in Russia that they have huge cities and tons and tons of people living in, in places where the weather is brutal. So fur is not frowned upon generally there. Uh, it's, it's culturally not a, a bad thing and uh, it's very, very warm and it's a natural product. It's just, it works great. So Russians wear fur. Uh, Chinese wear fur, uh, especially in colder areas of China. Uh, but also the Chinese manufacture a lot of the fur that's sold to people in Russia. Basically, what we need for wild fur, because North America does not consume a lot of wild fur like it did back uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. That uh, trend has declined because it's, it's fallen out of fashion. So what we need for fur prices is for uh, Russia and China to have a very strong economies and be selling lots of fur garments, fur coats and hats, uh, the people need to have money and be able to purchase those items. What we have right now is the opposite. We have a, a huge demand issue with wild fur because and ranch fur because uh, oil prices have affected the Russian economy uh, uh, incredibly. Uh, the, the price of oil, if you remember, it, it just plummeted from a couple years ago from like $140 a barrel or something all the way down to $30 or $40 a barrel. Uh, that's climbed up slowly, but I think right now as I record this, it's somewhere around $60 a barrel. So like less than half of what it was a few years ago. So uh, Russia relies on oil production as a huge part of its economy. Oil production 
and export of oil uh, really is a major driving factor in the Russian economy. These low oil prices are killing them. Uh, the China economy has uh, slowed considerably. There's a lot going on there. Uh, there's you know tariff talk. There's all kinds of different things going on with, with China's economy. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, it's grown at an astronomical rate for a long period of time and it seems like that growth was not sustainable. That growth has slowed and their economy is is kind of uh, it, it's it's kind of taking a bit of a, a break now and uh, not doing quite so well so the Chinese aren't buying as much for it either so the demand is down now you have the two factors that affect prices uh, of an uh, item like fur are supply and demand demand is down what about supply well, we're not really seeing a lot of wild fur being harvested except for a few items but the ranch fur makes up like 80% of all fur that is consumed. And so we have wild fur around 20%, ranch fur around 80%. Uh, ranch fur is in a period of very, very high production. Uh, we had a few years of really high prices. Uh, the ranch fur industry is very similar to like the beef cattle industry. It's cyclical, goes up and down. And what happens is when you have high prices, the ranchers respond by increasing production so they can take advantage of those high prices. And then they flood the market. There's too much supply. The, the, the demand cannot uh, uptake all that supply. Prices go down. Everybody loses money. They stop producing. So we had 2013, 2014, we had a very high uh, prices for fur. We had production increasing. It takes a couple years for that to all play out. Now we're at a very high level of uh, inventory for ranch mink and ranch fox, and those ranchers are losing their shirts right now. So what's happening is they're not able to sell items uh, for even half or 25% uh, of what they did a few years ago. So that's really hurting those ranchers, but they've got all the supply. Um, the next step, what we're probably going to see is the ranches start to pelt out or sell. Um, in addition to the, their production, their annual production of furs, they're probably going to start selling breeding stock and just lower their numbers of inventory. What that's going to do is further flood the market with supply in a market that already has low demand and uh, fur prices will probably continue to be low unless the demand side changes. But what that means is we're probably going to continue to see low fur prices. Wild fur follows ranch fur in the sense that um, as ranch fur goes up, wild fur becomes a, in a lot of cases, a replacement for ranch fur uh, or a substitute, uh, a, a more affordable alternative. And the same, in, as ranch fur goes down in price and there's lots of supply, uh, there's not as much need for a lot of the wild fur items. So that's just kind of a brief overview. Uh, I think we're probably going to continue to see low fur prices into like 2020. And that's probably, hopefully, when we're going to see things start to turn around. We'll see what happens on the demand side. So let's go into specific species. So there are two bright spots. So let's focus on the good, on the positive first. Uh, the two fur items that are kind of bucking the trend of low prices are coyote and bobcat, uh, and there, there's very specific reasons for this. Coyote uh, prices are red hot. Um, there is more demand for coyote pelts than there is supply for high quality coyote pelts, and uh, that's driven prices up substantially. Why is that? Well, uh, it's not because of Russia and China. It's because North America and Europe, there is a fashion trend that has been led by a company called Canada Goose that uh, built, makes these uh, downed, co downed coats that are lined, that hoods that are lined with fur. And that trim that lines uh, hooded parkas is made of coyote. So the high quality, thick prime coyote pelts that have lots of uh, density, uh, those make awesome liner uh, for hoods on parkas and those are in very high demand. A lot of people are wearing those coats. 
uh, even in North America where people aren't wearing fur coats, they're wearing those, those fur trimmed hooded uh, parkas. So they're very popular. A lot of other companies have followed that trend as well. Lots of demand. So the Western coyotes, we're looking at some pretty good prices because those are the highest quality coyotes in like Montana, North South Dakota, uh, Wyoming, the Plains areas, Alberta. Uh, we're probably going to look at averages of seventy to a hundred dollars per pelt, so that's pretty awesome uh, for those coyotes. Uh, the other areas, if you have a pretty decent coyote, that's going to help drive increased prices there. The Northeast, like uh, in northern New England, like where I'm at, uh, we're probably going to look at like twenty-five to forty-five dollars, uh, with a few exceptional colors and, and sizes that might be much higher than that. Um, other places, southern coyotes, you're probably looking at 10 or $20, uh, hopefully up to 20 but probably more on the lower end. Uh, but in general, coyotes are doing really well. There's a lot of trappers out west that are uh, just targeting coyotes, and, uh, and they're, it's going to pay this year. The other item bucking the trend is bobcats, but again, not all bobcats are really going to shine here. The bobcat market is uh, of driven by very high-end luxury fur coats uh, that are made with the, the bellies of these bobcats that you find primarily out in the western states. And the, the pelt has to have a really clear white belly with lots of dark, well-defined spots on it. And that's, uh, that white spotted fur is really, really popular with these high-end coats worn in Russia. And you might think, well, Russia's economy is not doing very well. That is true. However, the hot, the, in any down economy, the rich people still do all right, right? Uh, the top 1%, the top one-tenth of 1%, uh, those people are still going to have money to buy stuff. And uh, it's the same thing in Russia. There are some very rich people that um, a luxury fur coat for tens of thousands of dollars, not a big deal. So bobcats, western bobcats, I'm guessing you're going to average around $300 to $400, and you could see six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800 bobcats um, if they really uh, meet the specifications. Uh, everywhere else, we're probably going to be quite a bit lower. Um, the prices for other cats, you know, most of the other rest of the country, probably $50, $60 average, uh, all the way down to maybe $20 or $30 for like maybe Texas bobcats. Um, all right, let's now the rest of the fur market. Uh, that was the good news. The rest of it's kind of bad news. Uh, beaver been low for years. Uh, we're looking at average for beaver for about ten to thirteen dollars. There's not a lot of use. They're not making coats out of beaver right now. Uh, there are a lot of work to process, um, and there's lots of other furs that can be used for that. So. The market for beaver is primarily hatter market, which is, uses pelts that can be low quality, and they're used mainly uh, as uh, uh, felt to make um, like Stetson cowboy hats, and those sorts of hats. So 10 to $13 primarily for beaver, and the northern beaver aren't going to be a whole lot better than the southern beaver. You may see some 20 to $30 tops in a few for a few like really prime winter shearable beaver, but 10 to 13, I'm guessing is what we're gonna see. Beaver caster is gonna be pretty awesome because caster demand has remained high and supply is low with the low harvest of beavers. So probably top quality caster, number one caster, about $70 a pound. I actually saw an auction recently that got over $100 a pound. So it could be uh, pretty exciting for the caster market. The lower grades will probably bring 40 to 50. Uh, red fox, not a lot of demand for red fox right now, maybe $15 to $20. Muskrat, uh, early on I was saying I was saying 2 to $3. Uh, I'm up in that to 3 to $4 because there's been some recent sales where there's been really good demand for muskrat, $3.50 averages, $4 averages for really high quality pelts. So uh, I think we're going to see over $3. Uh, the Korean market has seems to have driven a change in the demand for muskrats. Uh, South Korea and North Korea are actually seem to be getting along right now and the South Korean economy is doing quite well uh, so uh, we're seeing some demand there. Mink, poor, they compete with ranch mink, wild mink will go five to ten bucks maybe. 
otter twenty to thirty dollars. Again, not a not a lot of fashion trends that would require otter pelts. Raccoon are gonna vary a lot. You could see like the really high quality raccoon are probably gonna average more than ten dollars, maybe even fifteen. But uh, most coons will probably average around five dollars. The smaller coons, the less prime pelts, uh, one, two, three dollars are maybe no value. Lynx for you guys up in Canada and Alaska, um, probably you're looking at around seventy dollar average for lynx again. There could be some uh, upward movement. I've heard rumors of some increased demand for lynx, so hopefully that's true, and hopefully we'll see some some increases. Seventy is way too low. Martin and Fisher um, should do pretty well. Those uh, Alaskan and Canada and Martin are really dark and really big in size, really thick, uh, heavy fur. Those will probably average uh, $60, $70. They could go up to 90 or 100 in some cases, but 60 or 70 is probably a good bet. And um, Martin, where I'm at, uh, the Northeast, uh, uh, Maine, Northern Maine, parts of New Brunswick, Ontario, uh, probably looking at uh, $30 to $40. Uh, Martin in the Western states in the mountains are probably going to be around 20, 25 probably. Fisher, we're looking at probably averages of, I'm guessing around $40. The silky females could do better than that. Uh, just de depends on uh, what the demand's looking like. They're, they're kind of a an item that doesn't have a lot of supply, but they're, they're a niche, kind of a unique item. Um, if somebody wants them really bad, that price could, could go up quite a bit. Uh, if not, it could be tough. So uh, that's pretty much the majority of the fur items. The smaller items, uh, there's again, there's not going to be a whole lot of demand for a lot of them. It's a low market. It's going to be tough for a lot of uh, items. Your best bet, you know, focus on uh, the fur animals that are bringing the most value, like the coyotes and the bobcats, uh, if you have Martin and Fisher, uh, maybe a few muskrats, they, they could do all right. Uh, focus on lowering your costs, uh, but you know we still gotta get out there and trap fur. There's animals that need to be harvested. There's issues with overpopulation and animal damage in a lot of areas. And uh, it's important to maintain the health of those populations through sustainable levels of harvest. So get out there, get trapping. And I hope this provided you with a decent update on the fur market. Um, well, I'll let you know. Keep tuned on to trappingtoday.com uh, for any uh, fur market updates. The auctions are going to be late this year. The first major auctions at Fur Harvesters and NAFA are going to be in March. So they cut out the, the early auctions because of the low demand. And uh, so we won't know a lot about the fur prices until the major auctions uh, go through. Uh, but until then, uh, I'll keep you up to date with anything I hear on items that have been sold uh, to private buyers. Uh, check out the Trapping Today podcast. Um, anywhere that you get, get podcasts, uh, search out Trapping Today. Uh, we do a weekly podcast. New episode comes out every week. And uh, I talk about fur prices there as well. So anyway, stay tuned and have a great trapping season.